Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's so nice to see everybody here in person. I'm Susan Foster Jones. I'm the Director of Education here at the museum. I'm delighted to welcome those of you who are here in the room with us, but I'd also like to welcome those of you who are watching us via live stream as well. I'd also like to extend um, a particular thank you to those of you who are here this evening from Mass Humanities. Um, thank you so much for your past support of the Concord Museum Forum Series. It's my honor tonight to introduce our guest speaker this evening, Professor Jane Kamensky. Jane Kamensky is the Jonathan Trumbull Professor of History at Harvard University and the Carl and Lily Forsheimer Foundation Director of the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Tom and I joked that if I got through that sentence saying Fortzheimer and Fort Schlesinger, the one <laughs> that the night would be a success. So I think we're off to a good start. Um, she also has taught at Brandeis and Brown Universities and has been the recipient of numerous grants for our nation's most prestigious foundations. Alan Taylor describes Jane's award-winning biography, A Revolution in Color, The World of John Singleton Copley, as brilliantly insightful and lucidly written. Jane Kamensky reveals the age of revolution in fresh new tones, as complex and compelling as the interplay of light and shade in the finest Copley painting. For those of you who heard her talk earlier, we saw some of those beautiful notes in Anna and Neil Rasmussen's beautiful painting out in Brook Hall. So thank you again for giving us that beautiful painting to use tonight. I'm particularly pleased to introduce Jane tonight because this past fall, I was lucky enough to work with Jane and two of her students, um, her undergraduates, on a community-based capstone project. The class was History 1776, and it was a delight to work with Jane's students and see them put her coursework into action. Her students, Matthew and Bobby, created high school lesson plans that integrated both the rich content and discussion from her classroom, along with the collections um, here at the Concord Museum that relate to April 19, 1775. I always love the fresh new perspective that young minds bring to the table, and Jane's students certainly did not disappoint. We were grateful to get the chance to work with Jane's class and these two great students this year. Tonight, Jane will speak on many topics, her writing, her teaching, her involvement with the Educating for American Democracy. And our moderator this evening is, of course, Tom Putnam, our Edward Kane Executive Director of the Concord Museum. So please join me in welcoming both Jane and Tom. Thank you, Susan, and thank you all so very much for coming and those watching uh, on the live stream. And Jane, thank you for being here. It's an thank honor so to have it, you. It really is a thrill to be in front of live people, except for students. This is the first time I've spoken outside of a Zoom room looking at myself in, in two years. So um, thank you for coming out. Um, and I also want to thank my friends and colleagues from Mass Humanities for being here this evening. So um, our uh, I did want to talk about this article that you wrote in 2019, and I want, uh, thought I'd just set you up to kind of tell the story that you used to introduce uh, the article, which is called Two Cheers for the Nation. I'll let you tell the story. Um, so I, I've downed, dined out on this story of a conquered youth um, many times, and now I worry that one of you is his parent. <laughs> um, uh, so I taught, I, I taught the American Revolution which had been the core of my research for a long time, but I, I had been um, excluded from teaching it for many years by a senior colleague who really occupied that space um, and who believed that mostly people who fought in the revolution should teach it. Um, and I, I, got to <laughs> I got to Harvard and I finally got to, uh, to step into um, the, you know, the remaining skeleton of a course that Bernard Balin had taught in, uh, in you know, to great glory in the 60s and 70s uh, and 80s until his, uh, he was right at the end of mandatory retirement in the mid-1980s. Um, and uh, I set up the course to teach the cutting edge of historical scholarship produced by people like me and my colleagues, which broadened and deepened the story of the American Revolution in various ways, right? Made it international, uh, focused on uh, the relationship between American political, early American political history and enslavement and indigeneity and uh, native expulsion and uh, the importance of the Caribbean in the story, all of these things are, are true and important. Um, and 
in the way that I set up that course, I think I forgot the special burden of teaching the national history of the United States within the United States, right? The special burden and the special opportunity of teaching a history of us, um, whoever we come to uh, be in an American university from, and my students are as international and as wildly diverse as any uh, student body in America. At the end of this, and the students all did wonderful work, um, and at the end of the course, I did one of those metacognitive things that the learning science people tell us is so important. <laughs> I interviewed them about what they learned, and I interviewed this young student from Concord, uh, Daniel, who was very excited at the beginning of the semester because he was a reenactor um, and was the third generation of reenactors in his family. Real citizen of a kid, um, uh, worked on the Harvard Ambulance Corps, like a, a you know middle middle class kid worked on the Harvard Ambulance Corps, taking uh, elite kids in finals clubs who had drunk too much to the hospital on Saturday night. So like a kid with a real service orientation. And I asked him in this interview, what are you gonna take back to your reenacting group from the course? And he said, I quit. And I said, you know, you were so proud of this, you were gonna bring your, your, your arms master to class, but the physics department wouldn't let the black powder in the lab. And um, you know, how did you wind up quitting? And he said, well, the course showed me it's all lies. Um, and this was a sort of wake up call for me about what it meant to own and owe the truth in all its complexity to our young people but also have it reaffiliate rather than disaffiliate them from social solidarities that are not only important to them and their families and their communities, but are important to us as we carry the incredibly arduous frame of government for which we have proven ourselves lately quite ill-suited <laughs> um, uh, forward into its third century. Um, so I, I use this story of Daniel as the fulcrum for redesigning the course, uh, naming it History 1776, which it, it hadn't been before. That took on a different valence in 2020, which is its own whole other story. But I, I did rename it and, and sort of seek a way to claim the rich and uh, to use a, a painterly metaphor, variegated picture of the founding that would invest rather than disinvest students in the work of owning our history, but also of carrying it forward. Um, uh, so the project that Susan so kindly described in an introduction that my father would have admired and my mother would have believed, um, uh, that is the project that her students did is part of that work, right? If you're gonna, you're gonna take in this literature and then you're gonna go out into classrooms, community organizations, uh, historical sites, um, uh, documentary film enterprises. I had eight of them working with Ken Burns's team, which is doing an American Revolution series this fall. And think about the burden of teaching this history in all its complex ways that, that make Daniel go back and say, we've got to add this story rather than we've got to whole, shut the whole thing, you know, mm -hmm. shut the whole thing down. Um, this is related, but the line is actually from your Copley biography. You write, reading American history backwards from the vantage point of independence flattens our understanding of the world before the revolution and indeed the conflict itself. Uh, uh, tell us how you involve, I mean, your students know the end of the story before you teach it and how do you, uh, I mean, when you read the Copley biography, which we'll talk about in a minute, you, you get beautifully enmeshed in the story in a different way, but how, how do you do that with your students? So, um, I, I think we've known the ending for so long and it's become fused with the stories we tell about ourselves, have told about, our, told about ourselves uh, for nearly 250 years, right? That we, we forget what it was like to live in the muddle of the middle, um, as Copley did. And the, the example that I use is a high school student who once said to me, seeing the John Hancock uh, 
portrait, which is a, a portrait of his mercantile genius done in 1765, that he must be practicing his signature for the Declaration of Independence 11 years in the future, right? That is, that is um, an easy assumption to make about, uh, about the, the revolutionary road. Um, and I, you know, when I teach the subject, I like to emphasize, Bob, Bob Gross was just telling me how much he admired uh, Mary Beth Norton's recent book on 1774, um, <laughs> which really is the year of collapse and, uh, and remaking. I also really like to dwell in the quiet periods which Copley's biography shows so well, right? So uh, the occupation of Boston in 1768 seems to inaugurate the road. Um, and uh, you know, there's tremendous unsettlement about Gage coming into Boston, settling the troops in. And then things are really quiet for almost two full years until, uh, until the so-called massacre. Um, which, you know, surely there's no going back uh, after that Rubicon has crossed, is crossed. And then, as now, um, there's a quite full-scale media operation devoted to saying the Rubicon has been crossed. We are on the road. We are on the march. Um, and some of Copley's correspondents saying, note how hard they have to work to keep this story alive and in the headlines <laughs> as we're all going back to our lives. So another period of tremendous quiet after the trial of the, uh, the soldiers involved uh, in the shooting on March 5th um, until, uh, until the summer of 1772 and even more uh, 1773. So this sort of stutter step quality where um, people have to continually make decisions about um, their own best guess as to what will create the flourishment of their families and their communities, and, and many of those decisions are wrong, um, and many of them are underexplored. We read a lot of the plans for imperial reform that people float at various points in the 1760s and even in the 1770s, uh, right up into the first Continental Congress of, well, maybe there's a combination of 18, and it has a president, but it reports to parliament. Or, uh, or maybe it is this combination of nine that, um, that's being pulled together uh, you know, in the wake of the Stamp Act. Um, and they, too, are subsidiary to, problem, to parliament, but there are various reforms. So um, those, that sort of stutter step groping rather than the teleological um, uh, you know, sense of destiny uh, around the American nation. Um, I think it's really important for us to for us to dwell in because we are, of course, still in the muddle of the middle of American history, making choices about what works and what doesn't in our form of government and what low um, what each of us can do about it. Uh, I mean, I think I'm asking the question. Uh, same question again, but uh, using your words. I mean, I did a bad job. No, no, no. But what the article is. You, you write it in 2019, and we're interested, I think, in have you solved it. In the words, you, you say that, I mean, on one hand, your students have a certain skeptical detachment from our founding mythology, and you want a certain skepticism. That's a healthy thing. But that your goal is to craft a pedagogy of the American Revolution that's faithful to the past, but useful to our fragile democracy today. And um, do you feel the current course is successful in doing that in light of not the failure of your earlier class, but the challenge that you uh, confronted So I'm going to answer class. that twice, because I've taught it twice since the article. And in the fall of 2019 and the, um, the sort of tailwinds of that cohort, I would have said, yes, I cracked it. Um, uh, hmm. So they were an intrepid band. They worked with the old state house and uh, and with the National Park Service site at, uh, at Longfellow House, uh, Washington's headquarters, and on and on. And they hung together. Um, so we kept our listserv alive, and we kept in touch. And when they were all dispersed with the pandemic, they decided we should do a reading group, and a reading group on founding documents. Why should... Uh, avatars of the new right be the only people who understood the Constitution. They wanted to understand the Constitution. Um, uh, someone had been to a, 
a conservative gathering where people had pocket constitutions, and they said, why don't we have pocket huh. constitutions? You know, why can't we pull out our favorite um, clause and article? So we, we met virtually through the summer of 2020, um, uh, our little uncredited constitution reading group, and they made it up as they went along, and it was higgledy-piggledy, and we read, you know, we read 1787, and we read uh, recent cases, and um, it was sort of the blind leading the blind, because that's not what I do for a living, but they, they hung in the work together, and they saw each other, and the ones who graduated mm. came back. Um, so this seemed tremendous to me. I, I could cry thinking about them. I, I still see them. I, um, and then I taught it again this fall, mm -hmm. and the course was twice the size, good sign. <laughs> um, uh, the projects were a sort of richer and more varied menu, including uh, Concord museums. The pandemic meant that they could attach to distant national public history projects because we had learned how to do Zoom. So uh, they worked with a school in the South Bronx that was devising an IB uh, American history curriculum that needed a revolution unit. Um, uh, so they did that as well as local sites. And what I felt this fall was that the, um, the vital, of, vital center of American politics, which mm. is where mm. I feel like I live and mm -hmm. fight, um, was not holding for mm. young people. Mm. Um, uh, so it, it didn't have that, mm. that same kind of catalytic impact mm. as it did before. And I, I don't know quite what to think about that. Um, uh, it's a hard time, mm. right? The students, I was saying to, uh, to someone earlier, they've lived 10% of their lives in this pandemic, uh, which talk about disaffiliative. Um, so I'm not, the jury's mm -hmm. still out. Uh -huh. um, and, and I think um, I'm gonna hang in and keep trying. I think I, I will hang in it until, uh, until the 250th at least, because there's such rich, public history and analysis of monument making and storytelling going on as we approach that, um, that anniversary. Uh, another quote from the article, you write, if historiography of the American Revolution today largely portrays a fallen world, slavery stands as its original sin. So how do you deal with the question of slavery in so this we, course? So we, you know, um, slavery is baked into Britain's North American uh, experiment. I think it's uh, it's just as much a fight for free labor uh, and various forms of, of bound labor as it is a fight for religious freedom uh, to settle the uh, to settle the North American territories for Britain and France and uh, and Spain and Russia and the Northwest Coast and everybody else. Um, I don't think that's the end of the story, right? I was I was collaborating on a project with uh, the, North, uh, the Museum of the American Revolution uh, for, this, uh, for this past airing of the course. And their uh, chief historian uh, zoomed in to class with us there in Philadelphia. Um, I'm on the board, so full disclosure, my, <laughs> my stumping for them is, is, uh, carries the imprimatur of a fiduciary. Um, and one of the students, they had just read Danielle Allen's uh, Our Declaration, which I heartily recommend as a sort of taking hold of the founding and uh, warts and all, but not all warts, um, as another collaborator likes to say. Um, and they asked uh, Dr. Phil Mead, the chief historian of, of the Museum of the American Revolution, um, so were the founders hypocrites? Mm -hmm. um, and he fired back what's at stake in the answer to that question? Mm. Like, you know, uh, how does it bind you mm. um, and your ability to take up the promises of those ideals as generations of, of people? You know, if Frederick Douglass could, could take it up, so could you, was, was the sort of meta message. Um, how does it bind what you can do with those ideas if people lived lives that went against their loftiest ideals, um, and don't you, don't you too, right? Like this is, I think ultimately what I want from students of our history 
is a humility about the imperfections of our own lives, which allows us to approach people in the past as fellow members of an imperfect species. Um, so, so that's that. so funny. Um, my next question reads, a word in the article jumped out at me, and that word is humility. <laughs> <laughs> And I, in the question, we, we tend to associate that in the more maybe religious or spiritual sphere than we do an academic or historical one. And you also use the word empathy. Um, so uh, talk about uh, bringing humility, uh, trying to inculcate a sense of humility and empathy in your students. So um, I think historians have two governing skills. One is the ability to think in time. Um, I also possess the skill. I'm, I'm great about time. Um, so the, uh, your question earlier, Tom, you know, what did it mean that they don't have hindsight, right? Like that is the historian's master skill of thinking in time and, and uh, using all the backward facing tools that we have to imagine facing forward. Um, I think the, the, second, the second skill of equal weight is empathy not in the sense of, of whitewashing, right? Um, uh, but in the sense of trying to understand people as they understood themselves. Um, uh, I think of historians as being forensic scientists, um, giving neither eulogies nor prosecutors mm -hmm. closing statements. Um, uh, you know, that, that to me is not, uh, those belong in other places, right? We're not courtrooms and we're not churches. Um, uh, we're, we're portrait painters, maybe, mm -hmm. or, uh, or scientists who really want to understand causal relationships um, uh, in the historic body. So I think unless you approach the past with the same empathy that you bring to your friends and family and community, mm. um, we, we'll, we'll get it wrong no matter what. But, but if, you're, if you lack empathy, you get it deliberately wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the way that that comes back around, I think, in the lives of adolescents, post-adolescents who are on the brink of going out into the world, is the need to think of ourselves as uh, creatures who need the empathy of the future, right? What are, we doing, what are we doing now that will seem ridiculous or, or, uh, or venal or deeply evil to someone living generations in the future and, and how might that affect our behavior. So um, if we can think of ourselves at not, as not being mm -hmm. in the pinnacle of perfection, um, I think that will help us too. Those words are kind of woven in the article in a kind of uh, uh, slight way. Uh, but one area that you are very uh, concrete about is the thing you're against, which is passivity, and that you sense that sometimes both the sense of shame about the past or overall veneration of the past can create a sense of passivity in your students. Talk, talk to us a little bit more about so that. So I, I think, um, I hope that we could agree that as a nation we're against passivity, right? Like that it is not a quality of whatever we might agree is the American character. Um, so that when incipient uh, critiques of various kinds fused into a revolutionary movement, it was about not being subjects of a distant and, uh, and all-powerful authority, but finding sovereignty within ourselves, right? Um, you know, we have a very <laughs> demanding form of government um, uh, that just does not brook passivity or, uh, or maleducation about mm -hmm. where we came from and, and where we need to go. So I hope, uh, you know, Tom mentioned the Educating for American Democracy initiative, which was funded by the Department of Education and the NEH in 2000. 19 and is now in its implementation phase. Uh, so it's a, uh, I'm one of a, a group of seven PIs that led a team of about 300 people spanning probably 80% of the American political spectrum. Um, uh, and, and that would be lopping off extremes on, on both right and left. 
Um, I'm a little dyslexic, but I know that that's, <laughs> um, that's I, I have a right and a left in there. Um, and I think that whole 80% spectrum would agree that we need active citizenry, um, which is not the same as we need uh, uh, community organizers, right? Like the, the action civics approach is anathema to, um, to many on the right, but that we need educated, capable, and active rather than passive citizens um, seems rather dramatically on display. So uh, I was going to do this later, but let's, since you brought it up, let's do it now. So tell us a little bit more about that initiative and what excites you most and how people here could get involved in it. So Educating for American Democracy uh, produced a national framework for K-12 education in history and civics going from kindergarten all the way through senior year um, and braiding uh, the, the sort of ought of civic and government education um, with the is of history education in, uh, in a thematic framework um, that can be applied to any number of courses as they exist. So we, we released this big report uh, in March of 2021, which turned out to be, um, uh, talk about not knowing the future, the eve of a new culture war about how we teach American history in the schools, which did not seem to be a borning uh, when we were doing the discovery phase. Um, uh, I think a governing principle of educating for American democracy is what we call reflective patriotism. Um, and this tacks back to some of the themes we've been talking about with my American Revolution course, um, that uh, it asks that we think of the United States as a place that we are all attached to in some way uh, and that is worth being attached to, not least because you can be critical of it, right? So that the, the patriotism is that sense of affiliation that I bemoaned my uh, having taught my student to disavow. Um, and the reflective piece, and, and may I say, thank God we didn't use the word critical, which was, um, which was, the, other, uh, which was the other contender. Uh, but the reflective piece is the, uh, a, a true patriotism rather than a nationalism in a republic is about the ability to, um, to be not passive, right? To, uh, to, um, to absorb and change, to critique, to move on. Um, uh, so there are, it's had tremendous uptake, uh, this framework, and uh, there's now an implementation steering committee doing piloting work uh, all across the country. I'm working on a eighth grade uh, history pilot um, that will, that's being put out um, open educational resources by a freestanding nonprofit called iCivics that Kandra, Sandra Day O'Connor founded um, and is based in Cambridge. Um, and it will pilot in suburban Denver, <laughs> Santa Fe, and I think Prince William County, Virginia next year. Um, there's a wonderful website, so you can go to that. And um, uh, I actually started my career just, I taught high school uh, history for a couple of years. And what I find most inspiring is to see those young history teachers, social studies teachers, the videos and the passion that they have. And it, I, I, I want to not delve too deeply into this, uh, as you just referenced, this kind of new war over the schools. But we forget, I think, sometimes of those dedicated teachers who are in there day in and day out, and they are in the majority. What, what we hear about are, are these fights on the margins. Um, but I thought we should at least reference it. Uh, your colleague, Jill Lepore, wrote a piece in The New Yorker, uh, Why the School Wars Still Rage, which one helpful thing is to remind us this is not a new phenomenon. But anyway, maybe just a comment or two about... Yeah, I um, mean, I, I think one of the things... I, I think it's one of the best um, essays that my... Uh, ridiculously prolific <laughs> colleague and collaborator has ever written, uh, where she takes the, the school wars concept forward from scopes um, all the way to the CRT battles now. And one of the things... Uh, Maybe which, CRT, just to be sure. Uh, critical knows. race theory, right? Uh, this this um, bugbear that has been uh, consciously created uh, to foment a culture war um, that turns out to be wildly successful. Um, uh, you know, culture wars are real. Um, uh, one of the things that I think 
Educating for American Democracy, EAD, and Lepore has thought about in this article is um, how vitally important parents are as civic communities shaping their young, right? Uh, we saw this in the gubernatorial race in Virginia last fall. The person who says the parents have no place in the schools is, is waging a losing battle. So we've been thinking a lot about how to enfranchise households and, and neighborhoods and communities in doing shared civic work. Um, and I think one of the things that's, uh, that's quite novel in the, uh, in the EAD framework and that can be scary both to teachers who have operated in a different framework and to parents is it's an inquiry curriculum. It asks questions, it doesn't give answers. Uh, it teaches the ability to weigh better answers from worse answers and the evidence literacy needed to do so. Um, but it is, it's inquiry-based, it fundamentally asks questions. This is terrifying to some groups of parents, right? You, you hear this uh, in some corners of the current culture war. I don't want my kids asking questions, I want them mm -hmm. learning facts. Um, and uh, those of us who occupy different parts of historical communities know that facts come from questions and, and, we, and, we, and we sift and, uh, and weigh. So there too, I think, an empathy with parents, and this is the core to me of Lepore's, uh, of Lepore's um, uh, wonderfully empathic essay, parents who are afraid of an intrusive state, genuinely, right, who are genuinely afraid of an intrusive state and uh, who want the thing that probably unites us more than any other thing that we share in the wildly uh, variant communities of the United States that wants a better future for our children, right? Um, uh, I'll, I'll say one more thing about EAD in this connection. What is EAD? This is Educating for American Democracy, this, uh, this uh, K-12 framework. It's been really thrilling for me um, at a rather advanced stage of my career. I've gotten to that age where I joke with students that I'm so old and they don't laugh. <laughs> you know? Oh, you think We're I would still understand because I'm so old and they just... Um, uh, so it's the first time I have ever really engaged in a truly bi-directional partnership with K-12 educators, um, not just, as I say, as a kid from New Jersey, Trenton makes and the world takes, right? Like, I'm the scholar, I'm gonna give you uh, um, the cutting edge and, and you'll take it somehow into your classroom. But this sense, and Tom, I think your question has this at its core, this sense that we need to care about what teachers need and that their needs in their classrooms should shape not only um, presentations to teacher audiences from time to time, but also our research questions, right? Mm. Like what, what does the K-12 classroom need and how is that incumbent on all of those of us who teach in higher ed? How does that, how does that if, if our work in asking questions is about perpetually reframing uh, a set of established facts, looking at them through new lenses, how, you know, how does the need of the K-12 classroom refocus the lens. And I've not had that experience of a, of a true two-way partnership between higher ed and K-12 before this project. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to go to your questions in a moment, but uh, I, I did want to um, ask a few questions about this wonderful biography. Uh, first, you all should know that Jane spoke here before when the book came out, and uh, uh, so we're not, uh, we didn't uh, have that be our primary focus, but sometimes the, what biography does so well is it just takes these questions that can be a little esoteric and makes them uh, somewhat real. Uh, so uh, we'll just do a, a question or a comment or two about uh, Copley. And of course, uh, one fascinating thing is, uh, as you note in the book, that he paints the famous painting of Paul Revere, and then he does General Gage within weeks of one another. So talk about Copley early on and, and what his profession was and uh, how he got his start and began to get his reputation. So... Um uh, as a portraitist, he's a, uh, a sort of higher level of bespoke artisan, um, probably more like a tailor 
than, uh, than our 20th century vision of an artist as somebody who goes off and breaks the mold and hopes that the world understands what he's doing. He's very beholden to networks of patrons and the networks of patrons in Boston uh, expand to include General Gage, uh, one of the most important people on the continent uh, when he comes to Boston in 1768 as the commander of, uh, of Britain's armed forces in North America. Um, that's a real get for Copley. It seems, I mean, if, if we're looking forward rather than backwards, the mystery is why he'd bother to paint Revere, <laughs> right? Like the mystery of the patronage of that portrait um, uh, still lingers, and it's clearly an important portrait to him. He spends a great deal of, of time on it. So um, thinking of Gage as the obvious one, and indeed the, the person who all the chattering classes of Boston want to come out to, to see and have dinner with and um, uh, you know hobnob uh, with him and his, uh, with him and his circle. Um, so I think it's a quite skillful, bespoke craftsperson who can not alienate um, parts of a town that's experiencing increasing polarization. He can wait on you, and he can wait on you, and uh, talk to you about the things that someone like you needs to talk about. Um, uh, that, you know, that skill of um, being enchanted by the human face, uh, as a portraitist must be, but also being somehow enchanting enough to have somebody uh, sit with you for a very, very long time and not become completely exasperated um, is a core skill for them. And then in his politics as well, there are times where he's cavorting with the Sons of Liberty and his name shows up on documents there. And then other times where he's supporting the royal governor, um, conscious to play it both ways or? I, I think there is no both ways at those points, right? So he shows up on a Sons of Liberty dinner list in 1769, I think this is because he is a son of liberty, a son of British liberty. It's not, it doesn't seem cynical or improbable. Um, uh, you know, there are eight or so people on that list who wind up as he does first in a sort of squishy middle and then, uh, and then in England. Um, so uh, I think he's He's playing it multiple ways because there are multiple ways to hear the story. And when I write about that dinner, I write about their exultant toasts to liberty and the sovereignty of the king. Um, so I think part of the facing forward is to see things that would come apart that still go together in his mind and his world. Um, and, and maybe because he is quite ideologically flexible, um, which becomes a pejorative term, right? To call somebody inflexible is not a, a compliment by 1775, 1776. Um, he, he hears a lot of it. His younger brother, Henry Pelham, is a, is a, a different sort of case where he's a hothead patriot, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? He's, he draws the, the scene of the massacre before Revere does. Revere rips him off. Um, he's, he's younger than Copley by nearly a decade. Uh, he's, a, he's a hothead uh, American liberty man until he becomes just utterly outraged and repulsed and is a much more ardent loyalist than Copley is. Copley lacks ardency, um, which is probably a job skill. <laughs> uh, you you're a caricaturist if you're ardent. You're a portraitist if you're hmm. cool. You um, referenced it in your earlier comments that the place where he makes a deliberate decision that really affects his future is his decision to marry. Talk about who he marries and how that... Um... So he makes a, a blessed marriage um, uh, for both love and money. And um, I teach a family history course and my... my the students now, well, the students now are post love as well as uh, as well as post money. Sorry, young people, but um, uh, they think they think that those things are uh, are opposed, right? People used to marry for for money, and now they marry for love, and 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 that was and probably still is false. Um, now they don't marry at all. Um, uh, but, you know, Copley was lucky in love and money. He married somebody who uh, I think he felt great uh, um, 
uh, companionship and amity for. Their, their letters are, are loving in a late 18th, early 19th century way. Um, and you know, on the ladder of hierarchy that was 18th century Boston, he was here and, and she was up there uh, through her father's mercantile fortune, primarily in the Caribbean provisioning trade, which is what ties Boston so firmly to the economy of transatlantic slavery. Um, and uh, he became one of the, the consignees of uh, East India Company T in, uh, in 1773, um, which he thinks is a terrific outcome, right? <laughs> like you know, having a son on the ground in London who can bid at, uh, at India House and actually get one of the licenses, like what could be luckier than that? Um, facing forward. And I think Copley, by marrying this family, uh, and Copley's a, a, a fatherless child from the age of 10 forward, um, gaining a patriarch, right? Uh, a, a true patriarch in the 18th century sense with all of his uh, richly um, entangled dependents. Uh, he gains a patriarch who winds up on the wrong side of Boston history, you know, exiled at Castle William in the icebound harbor in his 70s in the winter of 1773-1774. So I think once there is no going back for the Clark family, um, uh, there's both a verdict and finally an opportunity for Copley who cannot get himself across the ocean um, until there's um, that bit of shove. And um, going back to that original sin of slavery, Mar he marries and it, he becomes um, a slave owner by, through marriage, and that al also follows through down to his daughter who comes back to maybe just talk a little bit yeah, about that. Yeah, so he, I, I think this is a part of, of his complex life that really um, was hiding in plain sight from the time that the Mass Historical Society published his and his uh, and his brother's letters to each other uh, in 1914. Those letters were published, and his involvement, his direct involvement in enslavement, is all over those letters. So uh, he, when Suki Clark joins his household, uh, Richard Clark's Caribbean connections come home. I believe in the form of enslaved children who were given as wedding gifts which is a practice um, on which we still have a, a very insufficient literature. Um, so he has uh, enslaved young people in his house, uh, two or three at a time, which is, uh, which is the Boston way. And I think this is part of his aspiration uh, to join the ranks of people like the Clarks, is to become, uh, to, to join literally the master class. Uh, um, uh, which he does uh, without seeming hesitation. I never have seen an anti-slavery word from him, uh, and yet, and yet, he is one of the century's most uh, um, sort of full-seeing painters of mm -hmm. black humanity. Right uh, in the central figure in uh, Watson and the Shark, right, the apex of the Wash Watson and the Shark triangle, and especially in uh, a painting I write a great deal about in the book, The Death of Major Pearson, um, where there is uh, a black figure in the center of the painting, a, a servant in livery heroically firing a gun, which is, um, I think, without precedent between medieval art and the Haitian Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, um, this too goes mm -hmm. together in him. Uh, his daughter, who marries back to Boston, uh, a great Caribbean-derived fortune, um, owns, I think, one of the last human beings in Boston who is in bondage in the 1830s, right? Long after, uh, I mean, in enough, in enough legal bondage that he's manumitted in their will uh, in 1833. So um, enslavement ended by... Uh, by court decision rather than uh, statutorily in Massachusetts uh, in the 1780s. And here in practice, and, and the Gardner Green household on Beacon Hill can hardly have been alone in this, uh, is somebody held at least formally in slavery uh, into the time that Garrison founds the Liberator down the street. Mm. 
Uh, last question, and I really do hope you all will have questions. Just, uh, I mean, both London and Boston want to claim him, and uh, we really have claimed him with Copley Square, but just tell us a little bit about how that plays out. Do you really think London wants to claim well, you. him? I mean, I, I um, you know, this is, this is the poignancy of, of his, of that aspiration to go home and to be uh, a, 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 an academician among royal academicians. You know, in the colonies, in Boston he's one of one. In, in the colonies and the early United States, he's one, at, one of three or four uh, painters of, of similar talent, and you can say Peel and I will fight you. Um, <laughs> in London, there are a hundred people who can give him a run for his money, maybe more, and he trails his rusticity, um, I think both culturally, uh, you know, he's formed in the provinces and it's, it's pretty clear, this is my, I, I, I made this joke earlier, so if you've already laughed at it, you know, <laughs> give it to me. if you're, if you're going to remake yourself, do it at 19 like West does, not at 38 when Copley does, you know, wet West is wet, wet clay when he leaves the sticks of Newtown Pennsylvania and goes and becomes a court painter. And he never learns to paint, um, but he learns some very fine manners. He becomes a really superb courtier. Um, Copley, uh, the apple of his widowed mother's eye, um, uh, as his traveling companion in the Grand Tour said, too long the hero of each little tale. Um, uh, you know, really big fish in a tiny, artistic pond, never learns to sand down his American edges and corners in a way that makes him culturally fluent in that world of patronage seekers in London. Um, he's, he's as good as many of them, probably not a, a, a Romney and, or a Reynolds, but, um, uh, but as many of the academicians. But I, I think there's, you know, having a Copley in London, it's, it's, it ain't no thing. Mm -hmm. okay. Questions from all of you, I hope. Yes. In, in uh, Ken Burns' story of uh, recent... Franklin. Uh, ...documentary on Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin at one point writes his wife while he's in England with all the academicians, says, if you'll come over here, we'll stay. That's what he wanted to do, which I guess has a corollary exactly what you're saying. I mean, I, I think... Um, London was the center of gravity of, of much of the polite world, right? Not just the colonies, but the, you know, there's a whole Atlantic basin that is a sink that swirls toward London. Um, uh, Burns does this really well in the, he, he, he eggs the pudding a bit as he is wont to do, but he does this really well in the documentary showing these sort of very rustic scenes of Philadelphia and then you go to London and there's Hogarth, um, right? It's a, it's a busy, busy, fascinating world at a scale that is, you know, London and its hinterlands, nearly the scale of the Boston metro area today. Um, so I think the sort of sense of everythingness and of going to the place where everything they've read, every school book, every handwriting manual, every musical score, uh, all of the things that they have been sort of seeing, uh, for Copley the artist, literally seeing through a glass darkly, right? Like I'm looking at these prints and trying to um, think about what Titian's red is that West has described to me. I think that sense of being there is very powerful. Um, you know, the a question of the end of this book is, does he make it or not? Uh, you know, he he dies in a much grander house uh, than um, than the sort of fanciful thing on Beacon Hill that he builds for himself here. Um, uh, uh, I kind of she'd come back. Stuart, not or him, not Stuart painting Washington. That would have been a thing. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, yeah. Brian. I think it's oh, we're going to have you have the mic for the people who were. Uh, 
Can you see us having a commemoration in 2026 that is um, empathetic and with humility and uh, reflective patriotism, as I think you called it? Um, I think we ask... Do you all remember the tall ships? I, w I, oh, I was yes. kind of defined by the tall ships. Um, I think we ask an awful lot of public commemoration. Um, you know, no, I think we'll do something stupid, right? <laughs> I, I, I think we'll, we'll send up fireworks. Um, what, I, what I hope is that we will have an efflorescence of new work in the revolution, on the revolution, as we did, uh, I'm looking at you, Minuteman, and, your, and their world, uh, around the time of the bicentennial. Um, and I think there is great hope for schools, um, the way that schools can take hold of that anniversary and think about what monument making is and what um, the way that we want to build rather than only tear down a story, uh, you know, not accept on marble tablets, but not shred. Uh, like um, I often speak about the, I can't remember whether I do this in that article, the artist, magnificent uh, contemporary artist, Titus Kafar, um, who, who creates simulacra of 18th century canvases and then shreds them or crumples them to show what lies beneath, right? Uh, Sally Hemings behind Jefferson or um, uh, snippets of the advertisements for the enslaved men and women in Washington's uh, bound labor force um, on strips of the canvas. I, I think this is a, a, a revelatory and necessary gesture. Um, but I don't think you can leave it there, right? Like the so I think I think schools have uh, great potential for using this moment to uh, to think about you know what are the what does the coin look like? What does the flag look? You know what are the things that the students would build with that memory in mind? I I, I don't I'm not too fussed about what the party looks like. Um, <laughs> Tall ships was pretty great. Uh, Bob. <laughs> So there are a couple of things. One, I've never met anyone, however critical of hypocrisy or the revolution, who says I reject the preamble to the declaration. Oh, and, I have. You have? I mean, I, 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 have, I, I have as a sort of fashionable gesture by the young, right? Like, I think that's the risk of the hypocrisy question. If it's lies, it's lies. Well, no, but, but the ideal uh -huh. is... is very few people would say, I'm, I'm against life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So it, it, it's always seemed to me that you, know, you don't ever have to say it's real. It's both propaganda, it's, a whole, it's aspirational. It's aspirational. But that you know, seems to me in my teaching career, you appeal to the aspirational part of your students. It, but the other aspect of this is, can you, I wondered, can you teach the revolution as a world historical event, whatever you think of the actual conduct of it? Um, Did it make a difference in world history? So you'd have to talk about it. That's a really interesting question. I mean, uh, there, are, there are virtually no courses devoted to the American Revolution outside the United States. Whereas there are many, many devoted to the French, the Russian, hmm. the Chinese. Um, the French, the Russian, and the Chinese all took pieces of that preamble of the Declaration of Independence very, uh, very consciously. So I guess what I would say, Bob, is that um, I think it's good to recognize our smallness on the world stage, especially at that founding moment. Um, uh, and also to see, and this is an a exhibition in the planning at Museum of the American Revolution, the journeys of the Declaration to improbable places that are, uh, if the American Revolution wasn't world historic in the same way that the French was, and I think Gordon is quite convincing on this point, right? It's a quite modest liberal revolution. Um, uh, the Declaration is world historic, right? Those ideals, that aspiration is world historic, achieved nowhere, and dragged many places, including the secession 
conventions of the uh, of the southern states. So can I get can I have a yes and no on that question? <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Uh, Neil, uh, Allison will give you the. So it seems to me that over the last decade we've been going through as a society a great deal of self-flagellation about a lot of issues involving our history, and it's, it's been destructive in the sense that there's a lot less commitment to the, even the American idea among our citizens. And in and of itself, I don't see that's a problem, but we live in a world where there's other countries do, taking a different tack on this issue, and they're, they're doing pro-social activities to bring people together around a common theme, however ugly or terrible we might think those themes are. And is there, and democracies are declining in number around the world, do you have a fear that we have to change the fundamental way we teach history and refocus it more on the pro-social aspects to bring people together to try and essentially save democracy? Um, so I, I think we've had since the 1960s much more focus on pluribus than unum. Right, and, and uh, we have multiplied stories of American experiences. That's all good, um, but unless we find what attaches us to each other, I think, you know, I think there are two equally terrible possibilities. One is that we will decide that nothing attaches us to each other um, uh, when we are a nation born of that idea, right? that never realized idea. Um, the other, uh, you know, not alternative but related possibility is that um, those invested in the worst things that attach us to each other will triumph, right? Um, so George Packer puts it brilliantly, I think, in the Atlantic article that became the germ of his, uh, of his book. The Atlantic article is called The Four Americas. Um, and, and he says, you know, People will affiliate with a story of peoplehood. And if you don't give people a true story that is affiliative, you'll get a false story that is nationalistic, right? Like that your choices are patriotism and nationalism, and there is a patriotism that is not inimical to life in a self-governing republic. I, I do think we have to find it. I do think we have to find it and, 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 and fight for it um, and fight with it, right? Like I think fighting for it is fighting with it um, or else the, the sort of uh, Hobbesian tribalism that also attaches people to each other um, is a kind of least common denominator. So yes, I worry, I do, I do worry. Um, uh, and I believe in schools as that, you know, the common schools that started here, right? Um, uh, as the place that is best equipped to do that wrangling. I wasn't taught civics. I'm that, I'm that generation, right? That, uh, so I'm born in 63 of the last century. This is another joke that's, you know, oh, I you know, was in the last century and they, they write this down. Um, <laughs> and, and I, you know, I came up school age in the generation of American primary and secondary education that had decided that civics was a lot too much like Americanization campaigns of the 50s or like religion and ought to be left to people in their communities and churches, right? We, we haven't thought seriously as a people about energizing the teaching of civics for generations. Um, uh, the ratio of STEM spending to civic spending in K-12 is 1,000 to 1. Hmm. Um, and we make a national security argument about STEM. These are capacities that our young people need to have in order to flourish in a 21st century world. Um, we need to make that argument about civics. I think that's a good place to end. I have a few words of Jane's that I wanted to uh, uh, close with. Um, uh, she writes, the building blocks of democratic self-governance include tenacity alloyed with empathy, confidence with compromise, coalition building, and perseverance. My students, she writes, rarely possess those civic skills which are taught irregularly in primary and secondary schools and almost never in university, yet they are not innate. They must be learned. A lesson that you have helped us learn tonight, Jane. Thank and you. thank you very much thank for you. being here.
There's a little leftover food, and there's some cookies in the classroom that you're all welcome to join us. Uh, and thank you so much for coming. That was great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great question. Oh, well, it was fun. Uh, I really enjoyed the bike.